We just saw that logistic regression is a great choice as probabilistic discriminative model. And in contrast to regular least squares regression for classification, logistic regression properly deals with outliers. And with respect to full probabilistic generative models, uh, logistic regression is much more parameter efficient. Okay, so logistic regression is great for classification. Now let's see how we can optimize such models. So let's quickly go over the logistic regression setting. So we have this data set of input output pairs where I'm considering binary targets. So I'm considering a two class uh, classification problem, which means that I can code my targets uh, with these binary labels, a one or a zero. And this one of a, and a zero coding allows me to select uh, the proper uh, model, right? So instead of uh, specifying for each class separately, a posterior uh, probability distribution. So this would be for separately for class one, uh, the probability after observing uh, my data, I can model uh, the probability for each class in one function, meaning that if I'm interested in class one, then my T is one and I select, well, indeed the probability for class one. And if T is zero, then this thing becomes one and I'm focusing on one minus this probability. So I'm focusing on the probability for my second class. Okay, so this thing over here really is my probability for a target T given my input X and my model parameters W. So these X and W together, um, they are mapped through a probability via this logistic sigmoid function. All right, so we have this probabilistic model for the uh, posterior class probabilities, and that allows us to define this overall joint likelihood function for my entire data set. So the likelihood that this entire data set was modeled via such a model uh, for the posterior class probabilities parameterized by a set of uh, parameters W. And again, I'm using the notation here that this phi n is really the feature vector uh, associated with the end uh, data point. Okay, and then the popular strategy for obtaining my optimal parameters W was uh, in this probabilistic setting via maximizing uh, the log likelihood. And the log likelihood in this particular case is given by uh, the cross entropy loss, or actually this is the negative log likelihood gives me the cross entropy loss. And now in this video, I'm going to explain how we can minimize this cross entropy loss. Now, as mentioned before, this, this error function as a function of W is convex, uh, though it has not, does not have a closed form solution because it's nonlinear with respect to, to W. Uh, so this makes the problem nonlinear and therefore I cannot find a closed form solution, but it is convex and that is nice. So it means that I can find the optimal, the globally optimal set of parameters W that really minimize this uh, negative log likelihood um, via uh, stochastic gradient descent. Okay, so that's what we're going to do. This is my overall uh, loss, my total log likelihood given all my data points. And well, we can always apply gradient descent to go to the local or the global optimum in this case. Uh, but if my error um, splits in the sum of individual errors for each data point, then uh, this makes it a great candidate to apply stochastic gradient descent, meaning that we walk downhill this error landscape simply by taking a step along the gradient direction obtained by only inspecting one data point. So this entire loss for one data point uh, will be called the error associated with the end data point. So this is what my, looks look, uh, my loss looks like, right? So the sum over all these individual errors. Then the gradient or the stochastic gradient descent algorithm says that I'm going to find my new uh, weight parameter. So I start off with an initial set of weights and I'm going to update it by step by stepping into the negative gradient direction because that brings me downhill, that brings me down this error landscape. And my gradient was defined as the derivative with respect to all these model parameters. Uh, concatenated into a row vector. And that's why I have to apply a transpose over here because my weights are coded as a column vector. And well, we use the convention that my gradient is a row vector. That's so I have to put a transpose over there. Okay, so I'm updating my weights by taking a step 
uh, down um, the negative gradient uh, direction with a step size eta. And I'll give a little bit more uh, information about this eta in one of uh, the final slides. Okay, but we've seen, we have seen this recipe for stochastic gradient descent before, and it all relies on the computation of this gradient, or of this gradient over here. So let's see if we can analytically uh, compute this gradient, and if we have that, then we can insert it here, and then we have our update rule, which we can iterate. Okay, so that's what we're going to do. We're going to now look at one of these uh, components of uh, the gradient, because if we know how to compute the gradient with respect to the jade parameter, we can do this for all this for all these parameters. Um, so let's focus on this for now. So I'm computing the derivative of my loss. And this loss, so I'm going to use the chain rule here. So the derivative with respect to yn times the derivative of yn to wj, right? Because my loss uh, is a function of these yn's and these yn's are in turn a function of uh, the model parameters w Right, so each yn was given by the logistic sigmoid of my weights with phi n. So if I have to compute the derivative uh, of my error to w, I can first compute the derivative of my error with respect to yn. That's what I'm doing here, and I'm multiplying it. So this is a chain rule of the derivative of yn with respect to wj. Okay, so let's focus on the derivative of y of, of e with respect to y. So that gives me the derivative of this thing. So the derivative of the log is 1 over the thing inside the log. So the derivative here would be minus tn over yn. So recall we had this uh, minus sign over here. Minus, because this minus also applies uh, for this term. Um, 1 minus tn over the derivative of this log, that's 1 over yn times the derivative of the thing inside this log. So I'm again using the, train, the chain rule here and the derivative of this thing with respect to yn is minus 1, so times minus 1. And of course this minus 1 cancels with this or it turns this into a plus, so let me simplify it a little bit. Okay, so this entire thing then still times yn. Uh, the derivative of yn with respect to wj. Okay, great, so I already computed this part of my uh, gradient, and now I still have to focus on the derivative of yn, so really my logistic sigma model with respect to wj. So this is uh, what I'm going to focus on next. So now we're going to apply the chain rule to this logistic sigmoid. So first we compute the derivative of the logistic sigmoid with respect to its input times the derivative of my linear model. Uh, which is not too uh, hard. And actually for the derivative of the logistic sigmoid, this is actually what I uh, said a couple of videos back when I first introduced the logistic sigmoid. I said it had this very nice property that the derivative of the logistic sigmoid is again an expression in terms of this function itself. Um, I promised this uh, expression would come in handy and well, here it is, we're going to use it. I think I also said we're going to use uh, the chain rule a lot uh, <laughs> throughout this course. And well, again, that's what we're doing. We're con continuously uh, computing chain rules over here. Okay, so there it is. We compute the chain rule of this thing. So first, the derivative with sigma with respect to its input. So that gives me uh, this expression. So let's just write it out. So sigma of my linear model times one minus sigma of this linear model times the derivative of my linear model. So phi n to um, wj, because that's what we were computing, right? Recall that the sigma of my linear model was called yn. Okay, and then the derivative of my linear model with respect to wj, that isn't too hard to show that it's going to be the j component of uh, phi n, but let me just quickly, yeah, let me just quickly write it out. So we have the derivative of my linear model with respect to wj is given by well, the derivative to wj of the sum. So I'm just writing out the scalar product over here. So the sum over all these uh, basis function components or feature vector components. So wi times 
the eight components of my end uh, uh, data vector. And so I'm only observing this particular var variable, so W, uh, J, uh, whenever I equals J, right? So uh, this then, the derivative of this entire sum is just phi n J. Because if I is unequal to J, in the eyes of this uh, WJ, this is just a constant. So the derivative of the constant is zero. So yeah, the derivative is phi of NJ. So we mark that. Let's insert this over here. And then we've computed the full derivative. So this is then, and let me write it in the form of these YNs to simplify it a bit. YN times phi NJ, right? Because these sigmas were YN. Okay, so now remember why we were computing this thing it was because we com were computing the gradient, uh, well, the derivative of my uh, error with respect to the j uh, weight, and then we already computed this part, and then we had to compute uh, the derivative of my logistic sigma with respect to double j, and that's what we just did. So let's just insert it then over here. Okay, so this part was computed on the previous slide, and this is what we just uh, computed. So now we're going to fill this in. So that gives me Tn over Yn times the derivative, which is given as follows. So that's Yn, one minus Yn times phi Nj. And we all already see that things are going to simplify because these Yn's uh, cancel out. Then plus, what we see over here, so that's 1 minus Tn over 1 minus Yn times what, what we just computed. So that's Yn times 1 minus Yn phi Nj. And also here we recognize that this particular term cancels with this over here. Okay, so let's write this out again. So we have Tn phi Nj minus Tn, Yn, phi Nj, and then the other term plus, uh, let's see, Yn, phi Nj, minus Tn, phi Nj. Okay, and then these terms also cancel out, and what we are left with is a very simple expression for the gradient, namely Yn minus Tn times phi Nj. Okay, so that's really nice. We computed the derivative of the jade component of this error function, and it really simplifies to uh, the error that I make on my prediction. So because this was my prediction and this is my target. So this is my error times uh, the jade component of, uh, well, the basis uh, factor of the feature factor associated with data point N. Okay, so this derivative is this very simple expression over here, and that's not entirely a coincidence. Uh, there's actually nice, some nice background theory with it. Actually, it follows that if you work with generalized linear models uh, that work with a particular type of activation functions uh, called link functions, then it turns out that uh, the derivative or the gradient with respect to error always takes uh, this form. Uh, so I really encourage you to take a look at um, Bishop, 4.3.6 that explains that if I take uh, the derivative of my error with respect to my uh, W parameters, I end up with this form. Because it's not just for logistic regression that if I take the, the gradient of my error that it takes this form, uh, this, also, this particular form also shows up for different classes of models. And it has to do with the fact that if I choose my activation function, activation function, equal to what we call a link function, then I obtain uh, this uh, particular result. Okay, so this particular node refers to a broader interpretation of why this gradient takes on this simple form. Uh, but now let's just focus on the specific logistic regression case. Um, so this is what we did. Uh, we're going to apply stochastic gradient descent on this error function. And to do so, uh, we split this total error function into a sum of these individual errors associated with each end uh, data point. And then we simply apply gradient descent uh, by computing the gradient for each data point. And we just obtained an expression for what this gradient looked like. So the jade component of this gradient 
was simply given in the following form via well the the, the error that I make multiplied with uh, well the jade component of my feature vector. So that means that the gradient, uh, the transpose of the gradient, so my gradient itself is a row vector, and the transpose of the gradient is a vector is simply given by multiplying this error with my input feature vector. And that then leads to the very simple update rule that my new model parameter is given via my old model parameters uh, minus um, yn minus tn, so this is the error, times my feature vector. And it's really beautiful to see how simple my update, update rule now is, right? It's just my old uh, weight vector and I add, well, the error times my feature vector to it. And this reminds us of what we saw in the perceptron algorithm, right? In the perceptron algorithm, we also we had a weight vector plus actually my target times um, my, my feature vector. But what we did there, we only applied this update whenever we, we had a misclassified point. And now we're essentially updating for every point uh, weighted with the error that we make essentially on the prediction, right? Because this was a prediction. If my target is one, I want to this thing to be close to one. It's never perfectly to one. So uh, this will become a negative value, which means I'm going to add a little bit of this vector itself. So it's sort of like a soft version of the perceptron algorithm in that sense. Okay, so what I indicated in red refers to the similarity with the perceptron algorithm, uh, but this entire thing uh, refers to the update rule of my logistic regression. Okay, so this uh, slide summarizes the recipe for stochastic gradient descent for logistic regression. So we have this energy landscape, um, which isn't quadratic, I sort of draw it quadratically, but it is convex for sure. And that means we can apply gradient descent to it. And the gradient descent algorithm is as follows. So we select some initial weight, W, and we specify a particular learning rate. And what we then do is we simply work, walk uh, downhill um, this, this arrow landscape with step sizes eta in the direction of the negative gradient. And the gradient is given as follows. So that really leads to a very simple update rule. And now there's some remark. Uh, so if eta is small enough, then I'm bound to converge to my global optimum value. So I'm bound to end up here at uh, W star, so the globally optimal value. But if my uh, step size eta is too large, what is happening is that I'm, I jump, let's say over here, and um, my steps are too large, so I sort of keep skipping over the optimal value. So if eta is too large, then I may come close to my data point, uh, but uh, I will never reach this particular point. Uh, but if eta is too small, then it takes me a lot of time, a lot of time steps before I actually end up at my global optimum. Okay, so that's it. If I select my eta small enough, I'm bound to converge to my global optimum. So really the minimizer of my error landscape. And that gives me uh, an optimal, a globally optimal logistic regression model. Now what I'm going to do in the next video, I'm going to present an alternative to the stochastic gradient descent algorithm. I'm going to present a second order optimization method where a stochastic gradient descent is simply refers to, referred to as a first order opti optimization method because it is based on first order derivatives on the gradient. And uh, in the next video, we talk about a second order optimization method which converges faster to the global optimum, so with less iterations, and it also doesn't rely on picking a particular learning rate either.